Hi everyone, and welcome to the second of the week's lectures on sex, gender, and sexuality in modern Iran. In our first lecture on this topic, we looked at shifting Iranian views on transsexuality from the 1930s through the 1970s. And we saw that in the early part of the 20th century, people who were attracted to those of the same sex or who saw their gender as being different from the one they were assigned at birth were generally believed to have a relatively straightforward problem, namely an anatomical misalignment that could be corrected through sex change operations. These were relatively commonplace occurrences. By the 1970s, for example, multiple hospitals in Tehran, along with some other cities as well, were performing sexual reassignment surgeries. But in that decade, things started to change. In 1976, Iran's Medical Council introduced new restrictions that severely limited access to this procedure. After the Iranian Revolution of 1979, during which Ayatollah Khomeini and other influential clerics seized power over the government, the country became a theocratic state and sex change operations were deemed a forbidden satanic act. That same year, in 1979, the newsletter of the Medical Council of Iran provided a defense of the new regime's outlawing of SRS, stating that, quote, in general, changing the apparent sex through surgical operations and the like is not possible, neither from a psychological nor a physiological respect. I'll let you read the rest of their view in the excerpt here on the screen. The ban on SRS remained in place until the mid-1980s, when the government once again started allowing transgender people to undergo sex change operations. In 1987, Khomeini issued a fatwa to this effect, declaring that transgender individuals have a right to live as the gender of their choosing until they can afford surgery, which would also lead to the reissuing of birth certificates and other official documents in their new gender, along with, of course, the right to marry as they see fit. Since then, of course, Iran has gone on to become one of the major global hubs for SRS. All of this brings up several questions, like, what prompted the government's decision to restrict and then outlaw SRS in the late 1970s? Why was this ban reversed in the mid-1980s? And what does all of this tell us about changing Iranian views of transsexuality and same-sex sexual desire in the late 20th century? Picking up where we left off in the last lecture, let's begin by returning to the late 1970s, when sex change operations became increasingly difficult to get. At first glance, we might be tempted to say that the new restrictions on these were a product of the Islamic Revolution. But as we noted, the decision to outlaw SRS actually came three years earlier, in 1976. Increasingly, something that had been seen as a birth defect was now seen as a form of sexual deviancy, as something immoral. Men loving men and women loving women came under increased scrutiny Many argued that they were suffering from something called Westoxication. Increasingly, any public spectacle of non-heteronormative sexuality was seen not just as shameful or sinful, but as downright disgusting. It was associated with the term kuni, which in Persian simply means anal. As an example of these shifts, consider the life of Faradun Farukhzad, a poet, singer, actor, performer, and television personality, Farouk Saad was consistently mocked during his career for his self-presentation, which was taken to suggest that he was sexually available for other men. When he married a 16-year-old girl in 1974, one reporter spoke up about the bride's family and suggested that they were unaware of his, quote, moral characteristics. In 1992, it appears he was murdered by the Islamic State. As this example suggests, part of what brought about the new policy on SRS was changing views of homosexuality. Indeed, throughout the 1970s, transsexuality was detached 
from erstwhile associations with hermaphrodism or intersex, and attached to new ideas about homosexuality. Iranian understandings of homosexuality were very much in flux during the 1970s, and in some ways, the trigger for this was an immensely influential crime of passion that captivated the country's attention like few other events in 1973 or 1974. The case involved two 19-year-old girls from the small northern town of Lahijan, Mahin Padidarnazar and Zara Amin. The two women evidently had a romantic relationship, which ended tragically on November 27, 1973, when Mahin murdered her lover, Zara, with 16 slashes of a switchblade. Said to be the result of female homosexuality, the murder provoked a sustained discussion of this term, as daily newspapers provided readers with nine months' worth of coverage of the events that led to Zara's untimely death. While many different reporters published stories on this lesbian crime of passion, none were more prolific in their coverage than Pari Secondari. A well-known media personality, Secondari wrote for a paper called Zani Ruz, which advocated for women's rights. When writing on Mahin's murder of Zara, Secondari gained access to an unprecedented number of sources, including testimonies from members of both families, letters sent back and forth between the two girls, statements from neighbors and others living in Lahijan, and advice from Iranian sexologists. In one of her first articles on the case, she wrote as follows. The sad incident uncovers a mental illness that afflicts some young girls and poses the problem of female same-sex playing and homosexuality for psychologists and sociologists to study. I've included a longer excerpt in the clip here on the screen that you can read and should on your own. Throughout her coverage, Secondari frequently used terms like same-sex playing and same-sex inclined. In Persian, these terms are incredibly derogatory and are used to refer to practices that are unspeakably corrupt. This signaled a shift in people's thinking about homosexuality. Prior to this murder, female same-sex practices had been considered largely harmless, though possibly shameful, they were not taken nearly as seriously as male homosexuality, which was associated with rape, pederasty, and murder. Thus, one effect of the coverage was to elevate female homosexuality status as a problem to be confronted. But according to Secondari, the problem was not so much with individuals themselves, but with flawed social dynamics. In her reportage, Secondari repeatedly treated homosexuality as a social problem. As an example of this, consider an editorial she published in Zani Ruz, which you can see here in the quote on the screen. Newspaper stories like Secondari's contributed to what we might call the nativizing of homosexuality in Iran. Whereas in many Western contexts, this was understood on an individual biological basis, here, homosexuality was seen as a profoundly environmental phenomenon. Along with Secondari, other journalists who commented on this case argued that homosexuality flourished in Iran because of the closed nature of society, because of restrictions on social interactions between boys and girls, and because of parents' strong desire for boys, which led them to raise daughters like sons. If the problem was sociosexual segregation and institutional homosociality, the solution was heterosocialization, that is, more situations where boys and girls had opportunities to mix together. Like other reformers, Secondari called for the creation of coeducational schools, for sex education, and for the establishment of youth palaces, safe spaces for young men and women to socialize under adult supervision. 
This interpretation was not limited to the media. So too did psychologists and doctors believe that homosexuality was a product of childhood socialization. In his book, Sexual Behavior on the Basis of Sexophysiology, for example, Hassan Hassouri introduced the term tiranzvistism to mean a condition, quote, in which physically and bodily the patients are totally natural, but they display deep psychological disorder, such as considering oneself a woman in a man's outfit who is inclined sexually to one's own sex. And I'll let you read the rest of this excerpt on your own. Understandings of homosexuality, then, were located within this idea of developmental failure, which even extended to the idea that society itself might be broken. These ideas carried through the Islamic Revolution of 1979 and its aftermath, when Iran became embroiled in a long war with Iraq. The Iran-Iraq War was a time in which the new government introduced a heightened atmosphere of scrutiny of moral conduct. Waging a campaign for public morality, clerics and imams began policing different forms of sexual behavior while reinforcing traditional gender norms. The country's first leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, declared in 1995 that, quote, what we are most afflicted by is the issue of women and men, whether in educational and scientific sectors or in practical sectors, hospitals, clinics, and the like. More recently, Ayatollah Khomeini has also weighed in on these questions, most notably in his, real, in his ruling Tahir al-Wasila, which contains a subsection dealing with the changing of sex, and it permits it. Here, Khomeini explains why it is permissible for trans and intersex persons to undergo sexual reassignment surgery. This was a major victory for the trans community, and with it, trans persons began to formally organize into activist groups, pressing the Iranian state to address their needs. In contrast to Western-style activism, much of this work consists of quiet, behind-the-scenes negotiations. For example, private meetings with state officials employed in the welfare organization or the Office for the Socially Harmed. Through persistent lobbying, Trans activists have fought for the creation of special courts to deal with transsexuals' legal issues, for the formation of a specialized medical clinic for transsexuals, and for money for sending surgeons abroad for training. One of the biggest victories came in 2010, when the Iranian government decided to reclassify the exemptions that transgender individuals receive for military service. Before 2010, their exemption was provided on the grounds of, quote, moral deviation. But in 2010, transgendered people were exempted not on moral grounds, but on medical ones, as individuals suffering from a glandular disorder. This was a big decision. Prior to 2010, most employers refused to hire transgender individuals. Now, their exemption from military service carries no stigma, and as a result, trans people's employment prospects have improved markedly. And, with victories like these, the trans community has begun to change people's minds. In groups like the Iranian Society for Supporting Individuals with Gender Identity Disorder, activists educate the public on the difficulties that trans people face and build alliances with social service providers and other groups. Becoming an official voice within the country, they have successfully promoted a more tolerant, accepting mentality toward sexual diversity. As one activist puts it, quote, What we really get done is that a larger number of people in official positions, in as many government organizations as possible, are seeing us. They realize we are ordinary people. We don't have horns and tails. We're not scary. We don't contaminate them. These meetings, above all, work against the climate of prejudice against us. Changing the prevailing stereotypes will enable us to be respected and accepted as ordinary citizens. Well, that's where we're going to have to leave it for now. Hopefully this nicely sets up our two readings for the week. Please feel free to use the discussion board to respond to the questions attached to this lecture. And of course, if you have questions of your own, feel free to ask. I'm looking forward to learning your thoughts about all of this.
Until then, bye-bye. See you later.